Scattered well the seeds of Zion, and blossom wherever stand. Like trees majestic at sunrise, turn their faces to the promised land. All eyes that turn to Jerusalem, in prayer to Eli unite, and words of praise and passion, the distant mothers recite. And children all with fire of Zion, burning blue in their blood and bone, will rise to the full of distant roots and make green again their ancient home. For hundreds of years, religious Jews everywhere have prayed that uh, for the restoration of their homeland and for the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem. So with the establishment of Israel in 1948, they probably thought that their prayers were being answered. See, the thing is that here from Ernakulam, Ernakulam said the main thing is that they are very poor actually. And they went to Israel because Israel is a promised land. So they went. And they are now they are very uh, well off. Immediately after the, after the formation of the Israel state, Jews from everywhere wanted to go there. And in particular from Ernagulam, they being rather poor. After the Second World War, most people did not have any jobs, and there are no means of livelihood at all. So the Jews in Ernagulam, and that also has contributed to, their, to the mass migration. They were all uh, petty traders, excepting a few. But when I went to Israel in 69, I saw that their life was completely transformed. And uh, they live as we do. They have plenty to eat and plenty to drink. And um, they uh, dress beautifully. Their standard of living has risen very, very high. Less than 50 Jews remain in Cochin today. At the time the state of Israel declared its independence, a mass emigration took place, carrying 800 Jewish families away from Cochin. The community from the mainland, Ernakulam, the Malabari, or the black community, has dwindled from the original 2,500 to the existing 20. The Pardesi, or the white community at Jewtown, has diminished from 300 to about 30. A little away from Jewtown, Overlooking the Chinese fishing nets that line the gateway to the harbor is the ancestral home of the oldest Jew in Cochin. From an office adjoining his home, Sato Koda, at 84, administers a chain of stores across the state. My, my grandfather started this business, and ours was the only firm that was importing goods from Europe. And so, in old ancient documents and books. Uh, they call it Koda's Labor Pin Shop. We were importing mainly liquor of demand. And there's a saying in Madhyalam that Nyan Koda Radhiji. That means I have uh, taken liquor. So we, uh, Koda's name became synonymous with the liquor. Downtown Ernakulam, the home of Isaac Joshua. His grandchildren are among the youngest in the community. Most of the most 
Of the seven synagogues in the district of Cochin, only one conducts regular services. The others are used as storehouses or have been left to ruin. Scriptures, the scrolls, they are written in the Hebrew language. 
We don't, we don't know, know precisely when the Jews first came to Kerala. We, we have very, very clear, hard evidence that they were here in the third century of the Common Era. But, I'm of the opinion, the community is much older than that. According to the local Christian community, the Apostle Thomas came here in the year 52 of the Common Era, and he came here to convert his fellow Jews to the teachings of his Master Jesus. So, the Jews must have been here then, before the year 52, if the Thomas story is correct. Also, according to the records, the traditions of this community, uh, it began with the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70. However, we can go farther than that, perhaps. We know that the oldest known written word in the Tamil language is actually found in Hebrew characters in the Jewish Torah. And there we find accounts of King Solomon's trade with countries known as Ophir and Tarshish, obviously South India. This would date the cultural and commercial contacts between South India and ancient Israel to the 10th century before the Common Era. So how was this community? We're certain it's at least in the 3rd century of the Common Era. Uh, and it could well, it's probably 2,000 or more, maybe as many as 3,000 years of continuous Jewish history in Kerala. Hail and prosperity. We have granted to Joseph Rabban the village of Anjumanam together with 72 proprietary rights. The original settlers were graciously received by the Hindu ruler, granted a territory, and allowed to establish an autonomous state. In time, they were joined by other waves of Jewish emigrants. Fleeing from the religious persecution by the Portuguese in India during the Reformation, Jews from neighboring areas collected in Cochin and placed themselves under the protection of the Raja. He granted them a site adjacent to his palace where they set up the township that stands today. One thing about Jews anywhere in the world that has been noticed and commented upon has been our ability to adapt to whichever culture we find ourselves living in and at the same time to maintain our unique identity religious and cultural as Jews and in India there is no exception to this rule at all for the most part the religious observances of Jews here is like what is found in America in Israel in Europe in North Africa in China and so forth but I'm particularly interested as a scholar of South Asian religions in the uniqueness of the Indianization of the community here in Kerala. And there's quite a bit of that. For one thing, if you notice the way Jewtown here is laid out, the synagogue is at one end of the street and all the houses are in a row leading away from the synagogue. This, of course, is exactly uh, the urban planning, if you will, of the Nambudari Brahmins in any village in Kerala with the Hindu temple at one end and then the Brahmins living on Brahmin Street just as well as a Jew street. Um, another is the architecture of the Jewish houses here with the door immediately behind another door all the way from the front to the back of the house. That again is in direct emulation of Nimbudari Brahmin's houses. Uh, another small thing is uh, you'll notice in each home here in Jewtown there's uh, an oil lamp built into the exterior wall of the house. That is directly taken from Hindu temples in the area. Another, you're asked to remove your shoes uh, before entering this synagogue. While most will say that's because of these very valuable ancient Chinese tiles on the floor, uh, one also removes their shoes at the Parur synagogue and other ones. Uh, so this is also an emulation of um, local customs, we should say. Uh, here, the Jews developed in Hebrew literature that's written in India. Uh, there's also melodies for the liturgy which are unique in the world. Another uniqueness of this Cochin community in this synagogue is the presence of a second bima just up there in the women's section from which the Torah is read in which sections of the liturgy are chanted. This is found only in Kerala synagogues, not even in Bombay or Calcutta. And if you ask the people here why this is the case, they'll say that's so that the women can hear better. I don't know the origin of this custom, but it's true that the women in this particular community are the most educated and cultured of any Jewish women I've seen in any community in the world. They know how to read the Torah 
in Hebrew with the proper cancellation or intonation. Uh, they know every aspect of the service better than most of the men. Uh, it's a uniquely educated, uh, cultured, and dignified community in that way. And most of the historians believe that there are three distinct communities in Kerala. The descendants of the original settlers are called black Jews. The descendants of those who converted during the centuries are called brown Jews. And the so-called white Jews, they came to this country some 500 years ago or so, mostly from Baghdad, Spain, uh, Yemen, etc. Of course, one of the dominant uh, features of Indian society is, is a rigidly stratified hierarchical caste system. And we find that even religions that are ideologically opposed to caste distinctions, such as Judaism, such as Christianity, and such as Islam, in the process of becoming Indianized, adopting these kind of caste or quasi-caste distinctions. And that's indeed what happened here. Historically, I can't say anything about them. Socially, we have mixed. And I don't think there has been any difference except that uh, something that has been going on for generation two. Generation. Well, it's very interesting the ways in which caste manifests itself. And really, it did so only in two areas. These two are participation in synagogue rituals, number one, and intermarriage, number two. In the days of the height of this community, members of one community would not count for the minion, or quorum for prayers, of the other community. And then these were mutual kind of exclusions. As far as I know, there's been no intermarriage between us. What the reason is, I don't know. Neither they have come here nor we have gone there. Despite these two areas of discrimination, however, in other areas of normal social intercourse and friendship and dining and so forth, there was no discrimination whatsoever. So it's uh, quite a unique experience here where there's a rigid separation in some areas of life, that is synagogue life and marriage, but in others there's very free mixing. As I said, our marriages were not allowed to be taken place in the synagogue. And uh, my brother, Balfa, he fell in love with a white Jewess. And they wanted to get married. They knew that it won't take place in Cochin. So they had to run away to Bombay and they got married there. I also fell in love with a white Jewess here. We were living almost next door, the same street. So she wanted to marry me, I wanted to marry her. It went on like that, with the objection being there all the time. And finally when we decided to marry, we went to Bombay and got married. In the synagogue, they were married. And particularly with regard to marriage. So we knew, even if you fight for it, that won't come off here. In Actually, there was no problem between the two families, but uh, there were some older people belonging to the old generation and having the old ideas. So they yes, never wanted to brother, remove all those differences altogether. Because of that, there was some problem. And that objection was only with regard to marriage, nothing else. Socially, there was no difference whatsoever for any party or for any other household reference. We were treated on any Only inside the synagogue, uh, these brown Jews were given separate seats and they were not allowed to read certain portions of, portions of Torah. There were actually two classes in this particular synagogue, the so-called white Jews and the Manamata Jews. They were converted from the local people here, and uh, although they were converted, they didn't have many rights in the synagogue. For example, they couldn't get up of uh, their marriages or circumcision or anything like that could not be conducted in the synagogue and all. Slowly they were fighting for it, but the main fight actually came from my father, Mr. A.B. Salem. It was actually in a Gandhian way that he fought. He used to sit on the step here and he would move out. Even if people tried to object him, he used to stand firmly till his rights were met. And of course it was a very long, drawn out process, but ultimately I would say he succeeded very much. Yes, happily this segregation in terms of religious practice and even intermarriage is quite a thing of the past. Now some might say that the reason uh, 
the black or brown Jews, so-called, are allowed to participate here in the Paradisi Synagogue is because there no longer are enough white Jews uh, to meet the regular quorum or minyan for prayers. Or, some might say, because they need them simply to carry the Torahs in the great processions uh, for the festival of Simchat Torah. Whatever the reasons, this very un-Jewish aspect of Indian Jewish history is something well behind all of us. to get a minyan at that time. But on the other hand, now we find that uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to get a minyan, and uh, as you know, our number has dwindled down to 31. Well, it's left a gap that cannot be filled. Uh, I can remember Jewtown when every house was occupied by Jews, barring just two houses. Perhaps if all those people had been present here, the Jewish life as it was during my teenage days, would have continued, but now I sort of see the end within another five to ten years. Uh, we used to go to the Halegwas, for Purim, for Simatora, uh, we used to go to them. And uh, it was exclusively for our Jewish people. We never had any, any non-Jews, although we were very friendly with the, with the non-Jews, but we never had anyone at our table. For weddings and so on, the streets were decorated, the street belonged to us and there were very few non-Jewish um, families here. Uh, so then uh, uh, the, that intimacy was there, you see, the street gives us our intimacy. And now it's, it's, everything is so meager and uh, everything is so dull and all that sharing of happiness and sorrow which we had in our town is still there, but then the people are so few so that uh, that happiness is not there anymore. festivals come and then the empty look in the synagogue. It's terrible for us to get a minyan of ten people. The worst thing that, that could happen, happen was that, that uh, at present we don't find a sufficient quorum for the services in the synagogue. We find it very, very difficult. We have never won this service, service. But, but it's delayed and it's, it's always very uh, harrowing, you know, all the time we have to wait and call the people and, and so on. After now, we have never missed a Friday night service or Saturday night. Recently, we had a very sad experience that we couldn't get the repentant man. The man who promised to turn up didn't turn up. Well, for the first time, I think in the history of the town, we did not have Minyan uh, on a Shabbat evening. We tried our best, we were only nine, and we prayed individually and left the synagogue. Because without the quorum of ten, we cannot read the Hadith. There's no doubt that the community here is expiring and expiring rapidly. Having been here for the past nine months or so is something like attending someone dying. It's a very sad to witness. Whether it's a matter of a few months or a few years, we can't say we're not prophets. But what's happened here is irreversible, and the community is about to become extinct. I think the, 
very, very grievous loss for all Jews in the world, for all Indians, and really for anyone concerned about the myriad expressions of human culture. Egypt to Palestine. 
I can tell you why my parents did not play. They had some financial interest here. And uh, they found that they could not uh, take their money back to Israel if they decided to go. So one, that was one reason why they decided to stay back. And now that uh, I'm uh, qualified as a surgeon, a urologist, I didn't want to start all over again, go there and start all over again. Well, actually, I mean, we are very happy and comfortable here. We are very, very happy and comfortable. And uh, at this age, to think of going to another country and settling down, it's a real upheaval. And it will take time to settle down if you go to another country. I have not necessarily thought of going to Israel, but uh, what I would say is it's not so easy to uproot yourself, especially at my age and start building up a new life in Israel. Because my daughter is there, and that's one attraction. And of course, there's the Jewish state, and that's another attraction. But still, I think uh, my roots are here. My brother is there, my sister, two sisters are there. So one day or the other, I have, I have to go. I feel that if I go and stay in Israel, I'll miss all my Indian friends. The shopkeepers that I love most are the Muslims. I don't know what I will do without uh, uh, Majid and uh, oh, Muhammad and all these people that really I am so fond of. And also uh, uh, I have, uh, I am in many, many associations and I just feel I can't do without my uh, Christian friends, my Hindu friends, my Muslim friends. That will be a big gap in my life if I settle in Israel. I am very honest to, uh, to tell you that. I have always felt that India is my motherland. So that sort of attachment has always been there. Of course, Israel is all ancestral on that. And all Jews have to go and settle there someday. So perhaps, if at the latest, during Messianic times, and I have to go there. Uh, the Jews are considered Kutin as a holy place next to uh, Jerusalem. <laughs>
Gershon Joshua weds Elizabeth. The last occasion on which a member of the community was married in the Cochin synagogue was nine years ago. Scattered well the seeds of Zion, in blossom wherever stand. Like trees majestic at sunrise, turn their faces to the promised land. All eyes that turn to Jerusalem in prayer to Ira unite, and words of praise and passion the distant mothers recite. And children all with fire of Zion, burning blue in their blood and bone, will rise to the pull of distant roots and make green again their ancient home. <laughs> 